Please remember that nothing we say here should be taken as personal advice. The conversation is for entertainment purposes only. If you have questions about your financial situation, please talk to a licensed financial advisor. All right. Welcome to another episode of Future Money, where we talk about the investments of the future. That would make us money. Or maybe not right now. <laughs> right now. Well, there's a lot of stuff that's making money yeah. right now, but you know what's front and center right now and it's, you know uh, what's people people are worried about and what's not making money currently yeah. are uh, our banks, financials. Yeah. So this is kind of what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh I think yeah, we'll introduce we, our guest. Yeah, I'm so happy and, and and excited to have David Pollock here, who's uh is one of the SVPs at uh Capital Group, uh home of American funds. Uh, David is uh, is um, an expert in banking. He's uh, he he basically has a, a, I don't know a lot of experience. I'll give him I'll, I'll let him give some background about <laughs> his experience. But uh, comes from a, really one of the best uh, investment companies out there that we work with, and we're really excited to have him here to talk about what's going on with all these banks and the financial system, and really kind of get a little bit more of a. Uh, breakdown of what to expect and so forth. So thank you, David, for coming on and, and jumping on, taking 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 this time. I know you're super super busy right now. <laughs> I can imagine, um, yeah, right now. Yeah, yeah. David, tell us, a little, give us a little bit of a background on yourself and Capital Group. Absolutely, very happy to help. Um, so Capital Group is a privately owned asset manager. Uh, we do the simple things. We manage equities and bonds. That's all we do. <laughs> uh, we don't lend money. We don't do derivatives. Um, we have a reasonable amount of money under management. It changes as the market changes, uh, but it's about two and a half trillion dollars of assets. No big deal. It's all actively <laughs> managed. And each one of our strategies typically has a collection of portfolio managers and a group of analysts. And uh, so there's a team of folks called investment directors, and they're the people who sit with the investment group, but their main responsibility is to be able to talk about the individual strategies to clients, prospects, advisors, consultants, et cetera, people who are interested. Um, I lead that team for equities. And most of the times we're talking like a portfolio manager from a generalist point of view. Um, but a number of us have had um, backgrounds in various industries. So uh, for time to time, we go a little deeper into a company or a sector, in this case, banking. Uh, yesterday, I was uh, talking about healthcare reform. Um, <laughs> so um, my background is I spent about 20 years in investment banking. Uh, one of the reasons why I've got a, a reasonable knowledge of investment banks and banks. And... Um, about 18 years now at Capital Group in this role. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming on, uh, David. Uh, really could not could not think of a better person to have right now talking about what's going on. Obviously, we're front and center talking to clients about all the really moving parts of of the of 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 this banking disaster that's happening. I'm trying to use my words very, very astutely here. Disaster being one of <laughs> them. Like, you, know. just, you just came right out of the gate with the word disaster. Like, I build up to it. Well, when you have an SVB bank like SVB um, kind of, yeah. I don't know, fall I, over in two days. <laughs> I, I think any of us who were, you know, in our 20s and above yeah. in 2008 uh, are getting a little bit of uh, PTSD. Yeah. yeah. With uh, with these banking things that are happening, and we're going, oh, this is this the last of it? Is this yeah. the last of it? So let, let's 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 get to the lay of the land. Like, what? Tell us what's going on, David. Like, where where? How do we get here? So I think it comes back to the shift in interest rate policy by the Federal Reserve. Um, that's yeah. certainly been the heart of this, and they um, <clears throat> are getting quite a lot of stick um, from various quarters around um, their approach. Uh, but I think we have to understand the context. You know, we had a global pandemic um, and a sophisticated global economy has never been closed down due to a pandemic before. Sure. Um, last time we had a pandemic, it was the flu back yeah. in the early 20th century. We didn't have a sophisticated global market. Right. Uh, so lots of people are trying to deal with things that they've not dealt with before. And the Fed were trying to understand the nature of inflation. Yeah. And of course, inflation feels transitory because we're all doing weird things like we stayed at home forever and we spent money in different ways. 
And then we were let out and we started spending money in different ways. And we all went slightly crazy, like right. you do when you have cabin <laughs> fever. And that sees a spike. And you could see how the Fed thought, well, they're all out there partying like it's 2022 <laughs> or whatever, but maybe this will pass. And by the time they figured out it wasn't going to pass, they needed to make tougher decisions. Mm. So they decided, essentially, we're going to drive the car into the ditch. Yeah. We need to slow this down. and We can only do so with really, really um, tough rates and rises, very rapid, very aggressive. And we will do this until, and pardon me for mixing metaphors, we break something. <laughs> yeah. And they broke a bank. Yeah. And so that's why the market is reacting in the way it is, which is in the near term, oh, my gosh, what else is going to break? Right. I didn't like that. Is it going to happen again? And secondly, but now the Fed have broken something, will they stop being so aggressive? And so that's the Jekyll and Hyde you have in the market of, I feel really good about this. No, I don't. I feel really good about this. No, I don't. Yeah. So we're going through that at the moment. So the specific breakage was, um, again, due to the pandemic. So Silicon Valley Bank pulls in money from tech entrepreneurs. And it turns out in 2020, they had a lot of money to put away. Yep. So the money poured in over the transom. I yep. want to say it was like $130 billion in two years into Silicon Valley alone. Yep. And yep. if you're a decent bank, and it's questionable whether they were, <laughs> if you're a decent bank, you're not going to lend all that money out without having a risk assessment. Um, so what are you going to do with that money when it comes in? Well, there's nothing safer than U.S. Treasury bonds, is there? Well, it turned out they weren't. <laughs> and so the value of those bonds went down. And um, you and your listeners um, or viewers may um, recall that there is uh, two separations in accounting of, of bonds. Yep. They're held to, um, or held to maturity. Mm -hmm. And then there are the bonds that are available for sale. And if they're available for sale, they get marked down um, in the accounts as the price goes down, they get marked to market. Held to um, maturity, um, sorry, available for sale gets marked down. Held to maturity gets marked down at a later stage. And so they decided on advice from an investment bank that they needed to sell them in order right. to sort out their asset liability mismatch because, of right. course, the value of that had gone down. In crystallizing it, they completely scared the market and so then there was a huge run of billions, tens of billions of dollars going out in a few days. And that's when the FDIC and the feds came in. 42 billion in a day. Uh, more than that, 52. 52? Yeah, I thought it was yeah. 42. So, so you, you've, you've laid the blame there. Uh, and I, by the way, the metaphors are amazing. <laughs> Cabin fever, <laughs> running into a ditch. Uh, yeah. It's absolutely what's happening. Um, with... with uh, with the Fed raising rates so much, right? Aren't in my in my perspective, banks are business is really managing interest rate risk, right? You knew we all knew rates have to go up. Maybe not at the at the pace that the Fed that did last year shouldn't have SVB have much better risk controls or manage that risk a lot better than they have. Well, hindsight's a wonderful thing, and, um, <laughs> right? I, I don't think we should be blaming anyone. Um, that's for politicians to do. We should be having a thoughtful assessment of what happened. Right. Um, it's notable that SVB um, lost their chief risk officer in 22 mm -hmm. um, in what looks like they were unusual circumstances and didn't replace her. Um, yep. So that's questionable um, <laughs> the, the decision, yeah. questionable yeah. outcome. <clears throat> and you would have thought that with those bonds coming under pressure, um, that they might have approached the issue in a different way. Um, we're still trying to figure that one out. You know, did they really have to um, sell those bonds to raise equity in the way they did? Because that's what yeah. triggered it. Right. And there's going to be plenty of people looking at that uh, to ask that question. Um, I don't think, you know, when we get to the Fed, I think the Fed, you can understand the decisions they made. Right. Um, they did want to make sure that they didn't start raising rates aggressively if inflation was transitory. Because, you know, it's easy now, again, in hindsight to say right. when you look back in the fall of 21, 
Yeah. Um, it could easily have, they could easily have raised rates and then inflation came off and yeah. they could have crushed, you know, the economy. Yeah, right. yeah um, we were all excited when they didn't raise rates in, <laughs> in the end of 2021. Remember, we're like, yeah. great, they're not raising <laughs> rates. That's awesome. This is, the market rally can continue. Yeah. <laughs> the party can continue. the party can continue <laughs> yeah. yeah and then and then not so much thank you uh, for saying that you know we as advisors when we talk to clients you know people expect us to know why and when things are going to happen yeah. I, <laughs> I think you and i talked about this you know you know hi, uh, you said it best hindsight is 2020 but also really you can't know what's going to happen in the future however you know i think right now and and we're still this post-mortem trying to figure out Who's d- done what? I mean, I think the risk officer statement is, is a very good one. Um, but, you know, there is other banks that are struggling right now. Do we know when, like, if, if there is any contagion effect? Is there any any issues with other sectors? I know with Credit Suisse was hastily sold off to UBS. And I'm really interested in your opinion because I know you, you worked in investment banking before. Uh, what what is is that, are those things uh, jumbled together? Where, is that- where are the cracks? The, the metaphor I like to use is what I've been using with my clients is: Do we have cracks in the drywall? Yeah. Or are there cracks leading to the foundation right now, and we just can't see them yet? Right. Yeah, it's probably the drywall. Um, okay. There is very little uh, linkage between the business model of Silicon Valley Bank mm-hmm. and the business model of Credit Suisse. Um, the issue, though, that does link them is confidence. And confidence is a fragile thing. And when the banking system comes under pressure, yeah. um, people um, who are not involved in the financial industry question where they have their deposits. Um, people who are involved in the financial industry go looking for opportunity as yeah. well as risk. And so in the case of Credit Suisse, um, we were reminded of something that occurred in the uh, 2008, 2009 crisis, that the credit default swap market, where you can lay off insurance on your credit, is incredibly thin and easily moved. It only takes a few million dollars to get credit spreads to blow out. That gets widely reported. Confidence takes a further hit. Mm-hmm. And that is precisely what happened to Credit Suisse. They were in a heck of a mess anyway, and had been um, in a mess really since the financial crisis. Yeah. I'll come back to that. Yeah. Um, but it's also what happened to Deutsche Bank. And yeah. in the case of Deutsche Bank, everybody stood up and said the right thing. Like okay. the German government were right there. Germans tend to do this really well. Uh-huh. They just stood up there and said, there's nothing to see here. Like, we've got, we got more money than you. Go away. And in the case of Credit Suisse, um, the Saudi investor with 9.9% stood up and in an offhand remark said, we're not putting any more money to work. And that did it. That was no longer bank. working, by the way. Resigned as if... Resigned, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, spend more time with his family. <laughs> so I think, you know, the, the, it, the, we go back to, is there a linkage? No, it's only confidence. And then people can move the credit default swap market pretty quickly and they did that a lot in the financial crisis and if there's something you can move like credit suisse yeah then things will happen if it's something like deutsche bank things won't and i think the um i was going to come back something i forgot what it was what was i going to come back to uh you mentioned Deutsche Deutsche Bank, uh, Credit Suisse has been in trouble since 2008. (laughs) Yes, thank you. So that's what I was going to come back to. I think it's worth noting why Credit Suisse was in trouble. This wasn't a, oh my gosh, it happened because of the Fed. Again, there's no linkage there. Um, In 2008, 2009, Credit Suisse was in much better shape than UBS. UBS got bailed out by the government. They learned their lesson and they restructured the bank. Uh, Credit Suisse had no lesson to learn. They didn't restructure the bank. They kept kept taking risk. They kept getting into trouble. And to some extent, this is the inevitable consequence. The important point for people who are listening in terms of confidence in the financial system is most banks went through hell in 2008, 2009, like UBS learned their lesson. And so therefore, the foundations that you mentioned are way stronger than they would have been Had it not been for the financial crisis, and I'm not just talking about Europe here, I'm talking about the US as well. And what happened with UBS and Credit Suisse, I think that is the more important lesson. 
that okay. those that were hurt in 089 have come out strong. Those few who weren't, they're the ones who might be at risk. Silicon Valley was either not around or terribly small in 2008, 2009. It wasn't part yeah. of it. Credit Suisse. It's interesting. The ones that are being impacted are the ones who weren't strengthened by yeah. their near-death experiences in 2008, 2009. Yeah, seasoned veterans with their battle scars yeah. uh, and the government uh, standing over their heads. So, government so, money, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> two, so two questions with that to follow up. One is, you know, First Republic Bank, obviously, you know, up until a month ago, First Republic Bank, at least in California where we are, is was thought of as one of the premier banks here. High net worth clientele, excellent track record. Not yeah. not an overly leveraged lowest, bank, good good wealth lowest management default division, rate lowest is, default rates. Or any institution. And then so two hundred billion in deposits. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, you, your credit credit default swap thing got me thinking. Is is this mainly a credit default swap thing? Obviously, Silicon Valley Bank affected First Republic because they're sort of like the closest sort of uh, image of Silicon Valley Bank, so everybody gets scared, right? By the way, it's important bank. to say that First Republic is not, has not folded, is still Correct. operating, yeah, yeah. it's still just But the stock went from 200 to 13. Right. Right, so um, so it, it's, you know, it's not it's not broken down yet all the way, but it's it's certainly gone in that path. So is is it just a crisis of confidence because they're viewed as, as a Silicon Valley, uh, not the bank, but a, they work with Silicon Valley type people, uh, and then no, I I, I think it's simpler. Okay. Um, when you look at their asset liability mix, it was similar, and, and you okay. hit on it. One of the strengths that was seen was that they had a really solid yeah. um, deposit base. The problem yeah. was putting that money to work on the other side of the balance right. sheet. You can't loan it out quick enough, so they had a lot in bonds. Yeah. Now, unlike Silicon Valley, they didn't have that same split between HTM and AFS, so they weren't forced to crystallize the problem. Right. But nevertheless, in investors' minds and the people who had their money, depositors' minds, they yep. are therefore in the same zip code. Got and once deposit flows start going out, so I yep. spoke to a few people who um, were customers of um, First Republic and said, okay, so a whole bunch of Wall Street banks have stood behind Silicon Valley. They put 30 right. billion of their own deposits in. How do you feel about that? They said, I'm not sticking around to find out. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So um, that's the issue. It comes back to confidence and the linkages really quite can be quite fragile, but that, that was the link. It was that asset liability mix that was similar to Silicon Valley. So as a side note, and this is a question that's been coming up quite a bit these days with these bank failures, um, what's the difference between a bank and a brokerage account? Uh, when you put your money in a bank, you become a creditor of that bank. In other words, you put the money there and that bank is the one that's making investment decisions about where that money goes. So they loan it out, they invest in businesses and real estate and so forth. When you own a brokerage account, you own the assets. So the bank is not making investments for you. You're making an investment directly in the assets that you're buying. You can feel free to move them whenever you choose, even when a company is in distress. But you own those direct assets and you're not a creditor like at a bank. What else is important to make sure is the company that you're working with is a fiduciary and is independent. So we work with a lot of our clients and we have independent fiduciary products to make sure that we don't recommend loans to our clients. We don't try to tie up their assets and mortgages and lines of credit and all that kind of stuff. And we can focus on specifically managing their assets in the best way possible for them. Yeah. These are very important distinctions. So you can understand what's when you put your money somewhere, what are the ramifications of that decision? Two, FDIC. FDIC is a government program that helps protect banks whenever when it, what they help protect your assets whenever that bank fails. So in other words, if that bank fails, you're guaranteed up to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. In the brokerage world, we have something called SIPC which in the case that brokerage fails, you have protections up to $500,000. So it's the equivalent of FDIC, but for brokerage firm, and it's up to $500,000 versus $250,000. Yeah, and I think it's important to understand that that's against failure of the broker dealer or of the custodian, whoever's holding the assets. Yep. And in addition to that, we actually do have programs if, if clients are interested in extra FDIC insurance, we have programs where they basically aggregate your money 
in cash yep. up to two and a half million dollars for individuals and five million for couples. So there's there's a lot more out there than what the banking world leads us to believe. Yeah. Yeah. And this is really it's great that we can actually share this information because there is a lot of other options outside of the bank. And now let's go back to the podcast. <laughs> yeah. So the banking, I mean, the banking system is a confidence game, right? So sure. and, and, and like like you, I think we have a lot of clients who have bank accounts with First Republic. And last two weeks has been, you know, why would I keep my money? Even if they are around still, I have no reason to keep my money there yeah. because, you know, they have all these basically perceived issues. Yeah. Right? And then my question becomes is, First Republic Bank has been known to give lines of credit at below market value to people and they tie in people's accounts into right. this stuff. And, and how does that all work and unwind itself now? If Silicon, uh, sorry, if First Republic does go down and or there's a run on the remaining <laughs> funds on, of the yep. bank, like what happens to all these loans? Like, you know, they, it's like, oh, you have to keep X amount of dollars in your account for this loan to get the preferred rate. Like, it's just a big I think, I think, there. I think here, the, the question here is FDIC, right? Like, what can you tell, talk a little bit, David, about how the FDIC would work in the situation and how they did it with Silicon Valley Bank? So the FDIC obviously can insure up to 250000 Um And there have been a number of comments that the market is still trying to digest around how far they will go. And you hear people passing the words of um, Secretary Yellen to try and get an understanding. Um, I think it's still being worked out. It's not clear. Yeah. Um, but what is clear is it's 250,000 today. Right. Um, yeah. And then everything else will be treated on a case by case basis. Okay. Um, now, what's the FDIC done about um, Silicon Valley? Well, you know, there has been this purchase of the assets Yep. And um, FDIC with Silicon Valley and um, Signature Bank have probably uh, taken, you, you, it was a question you were asking, probably taken about a 20 billion hit yep. to the insurance fund. That's due to marks on the loan book. Yep. Um, there's the possibility that, because um, they haven't really started talking about the securities book, and so if and when they do that, there might be an additional loss. So yeah. that's where the FDIC has really come in. And to be yeah. clear, right, the FDIC fund itself has, what, $110 billion or yeah. something? Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's, not, it's not insignificant. Okay. Yeah. The, the issue of you know, what depositors do, that's very much up to them and not for me to advise. But right. um, I think you know, the practice of tying in attractive loans to large um, bodies of deposit it is not just the First Republic issue. It's sure. done by yeah. most sort of high net worth yeah. private banks. Right. Yeah. Um, but it does raise questions. You right. know, the, the extent to which your money is available if it's tied up. Right. And right. each bank, I'm sure, will deal with that separately. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but I guess the bigger point is that when you base a brand like First Republic did, which was an excellent brand right. on customer service, um, assurity, those kind of things, um, that brand can disappear. It's based on trust. Yeah. yeah. Right. And um, yeah, that can diminish really, really quickly in a situation like uh, this. It's the old saying, right? It takes a lifetime to build a reputation and yeah. a day to ruin it. Yeah. It's it's so amazing to me how fragile things have have been or have are, yeah. right? In they the always Span, span two weeks basically. Yeah, one of the best banks in America became one of the worst. Yeah, well, in theory, right? actually, yeah. Let me take the other side of that. I mean, yeah, but here we are. <laughs> like nobody went under at the weekend. Markets have been yeah. recovering. Yeah. Deposit flows have essentially slowed right, right. down. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I might take the other side and say it's amazing how robust the system was, how rapid the responses were, both by yeah. the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, um, the Swiss National Bank, sure. and how at the moment it appears we've nipped this one in the bud. Now, you know, you hear, you, you, you never hear a commentator say, I think everything is going to be fine. <laughs> <laughs> All fair. commentators have to yeah. say, yeah, yeah, you know, I think there's another shoe to drop, or we've got to be worried about the fragility yeah. of the system. That's fine. And maybe we do. And it's a hostage to fortune. <laughs> yeah. Everything's going to be okay. But yeah. 
you know, we're I don't know not, if we can. Uh, yeah. And I was going to say about your word, the crisis. Like, crisis? <laughs> really? I was in 2008, 2009. I he said disaster, to be clear. Yeah. He said disaster, which I, I don't okay. know if that's worse so than since crisis. You, since you went there. Okay? Wait, since wait hang on. Do, do we, I, I don't know if we count as commentators or not, but <laughs> no. I'm going to say, ready? I think everything's going to be okay. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> okay, but since, since you went there, okay, I have to ask this question. I've been around 2008, 2009, like you were, and Bear Stearns went under in March of 2008, right? And we all thought, okay, this is bad. It was rescued by JP Morgan at the time, and I think at $2 share or whatever, and we thought it was fine. Like, okay, this is it. And it turns out this actually was the canary in the mine, right? This was like the, the first route to drop, and things got a lot worse. Now, I don't, obviously, I don't want to say that it's the same thing because it's a completely different environment and, and the system is a lot safer. But can you, is there a corollary there? Is there anything there? Probably not. Perfect. Um, <laughs> that's, I, it, that's it. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've seen this reported on, you know, it's, and, and this is the, you know, the, the folks saying, you see, last time, every time everybody yeah. said it was okay with Bear Stearns, it wasn't, was it? You know, mm -hmm. and so that's got everybody thinking, is it going to be the financial crisis? I mean, just to restate the facts, yeah. um, the U.S. banking system is way better capitalized, has much more liquidity um, than in 2008, 2009, 2009. Secondly, the regulators, Janet Yellen was around during yep. eight, nine. Yeah. You know, they they they've got a much better playbook than they had then. Yeah. Um, thirdly, these aren't the securities markets. Mm -hmm. These aren't collateralized debt obligations or other um, securitized assets. This is a simple asset liability mismatch. Sure. And this is much more like the various savings and loan crises that we had. And whilst they were, you know, a hit. Um, they're really only a footnote in history. Um, we'll see if this turns out to be as severe as one of the savings and loan crises. I think it's going to have a massive impact in a couple of areas. Um, firstly, it's going to have an impact on the lending capabilities of U.S. banks um, yep. into the U.S. economy. That's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Mm. That'll be a slower burn. Yep. Probably takes a quarter to half a percent off um, anybody's forecast of GDP. Still to be determined. We don't know what the regulators are going to do, but probably they're going to need more capital from the regional banks. They're probably going to need more liquidity. Yeah. Um, everybody's looking at what's a systemically important bank. And of course, right. you know, everybody in the political firmament is now looking around like, was this because the Federal Reserve in San Francisco were woke? Or was this because the <laughs> Trump administration were lax, right? right. <laughs> Pick your side, have a debate. Right. Um, well, let's let's go there for one second. On. Let, 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 let me finish yeah. the point. Sure. I thought I'd get a rise out of the political comment. But <laughs> you, you, really you, did. politicians will, will look to make the most of it with the benefit of hindsight. Again, probably the, the, um, the systemically important level was lowered too far. Um, and... It was the San Francisco Fed who were on watch. So, yep. you know, you can make an argument either way. But I think the despite those things, this was simply one or two banks that had an exceptional amount of money come in. The only place they could put it was in an asset class that then deteriorated. And one of them had poor controls so that those didn't get caught in time. I, I, th I think there are more exceptions here. And then the bank that went under or got taken over in Europe, that had been a basket case for some time. I think yeah. there's a lot of extrapolation about the health of the financial system that probably is unwarranted. Got it. So, so with the regulation, real quick, you know, to, this is not going to be a, was this a Republican or a Democratic thing? But did the regulation deregulation right? Because the Democrats are you know wanting to point the finger at Republicans. Republicans, like you said, are wanting to point it back. But did the deregulation of the regional banks help lead to this? And, and if that didn't happen, would we have – obviously, this is all speculation here. Yeah. Would we have avoided or at least mitigated this uh, thing that we've been gone through with Silicon Valley Bank and such? And you're talking 2018, 2019. Yeah, 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 the rollback yeah, yeah, yeah. of the regulations yeah. from the Trump yeah. administration, right. which at the time, by the way, for many people was hailed as a, as a good move for the economy. Correct. Yeah, and I think, again, we need to look at the exception rather than 
yeah. the majority. So in most cases, reducing the regulatory burden on banks between 50 and 250 billion um, has paid off in a number of ways in terms of loan growth, the ability to offer folks the investment banking services they want. But one bank <laughs> um, got it wrong. Yeah. They, and, and time will tell, you know, how culpable people were in them getting it wrong. Yeah. And that bank made a, an error in its asset liability mismatch and then made an error um, in how it sought to strengthen its balance sheet. And it uh, then created a crisis of confidence. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's too early to tell whether or not the regulations caused it whether um, lax regulatory oversight caused it, uh, whether poor um, management caused it, or whether it was simply a case of they got their asset liability mismatch wrong, and these things happen. Um, uh, reality would say that it's probably a little bit of all three. Right. The perfect. The that's, perfect that's, that's usually the answer. Isn't it? <laughs> it's a bit yeah. of a, and I think it yeah. is highly unusual circumstances. Again, I, I, I want to. You know, reinforce the point that coming out of a global pandemic right. is, yeah. is 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 unique yeah, sure. in a financial system as sophisticated as ours. Yeah. Uh, and so who knew Silicon Valley Bank did not know that mm -hmm. they would get all of those deposits in in two years. Yeah. yeah. So, I, you know, I, I could not have said it best. Thank you for saying, you know, that we should not panic at this time. Right? Panic is never a good strategy. You know, you have to look at things a lot more you know, in, in more detail and see that really the financial system is a lot safer. And that's kind of what we've been telling to our clients, right? You have to be, you know, you can't just look at the newscasters because, you know, they sell, they're trying to sell papers and, and, you know, selling the panic is really what works, right? So it's really important to do that. So I'm so glad that you said it in the way that you did. Yeah. Uh, let's move a little bit towards um, what this impact will have, let's say, on the tech sector, like a bank like SVB that has been so, so uh, critical in redeveloping the, 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 the tech sector in a sense and providing all the, the, all the financing and so forth. What do you expect that will have or maybe secondary and tertiary effects? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I, I think to some extent the reason Silicon Valley was in trouble was the tech sector was already um, yeah. having issues getting the money they needed. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things that was occurring was the, um, the various investors um, who had money, who were, were you know, tech yeah. company owners, were withdrawing those deposits at a more rapid rate yeah. than SVB had previously anticipated. Um, because they had to pay for the ongoing uh, running of their businesses and they weren't able to get the financing they wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the slowdown in the capital available for the tech sector um, was well underway. Yeah. And I think this is more of a consequence of that rather than the forerunner of any um, more serious tightening of uh, the... Um, uh, tightening of the financial conditions. Right. So I, th I think the tech sector, I mean, you can see it with the job layoffs that are coming, you know, right. almost daily being announced. If 2008, yep. 2009 was a big impact on the East Coast, particularly the Northeast, right. um, in terms of the economy. And I remember at the time, you know, working for Capital Group, which is Los Angeles based, you know, yep. parent of the American funds, there was a sense of, you know, among a number of people out there, not the ones involved in the markets, but right. other folks like, gosh, is it really that bad? <laughs> um, but for those of us who work for Capital Group in New York, the answer was, yeah. <laughs> um, this time around, yeah. the um, the economic impact is going to be felt much more clearly um, on the West Coast in places like the Bay Area. Yeah, we've been seeing, I mean, we work with a lot of their clients and, yeah. and we've been seeing that last year with the layoffs and the anxiety in general. Yeah. And I think this is exasperating the stuff. Do you, do you ascribe to the uh, fact that the VCs who a lot of them had their money at SVB have kind of really accelerated this? They this threw gas on the fire. Yeah, like yeah kind of. You... Yeah, I again, I don't um, don't want to point the finger at anybody, but you know, we didn't have really have the same degree 
of social media influence in 2008, 2009 that we do now. And there's a pessimistic and a optimistic way of thinking about that. The pessimistic way of thinking about it is, you know, they you know, pouring mm. gas on the fire and, you know, maybe it wouldn't have broken out if that hadn't happened. Mm. Uh, the more optimistic way of thinking about it is maybe that's why it flared up really rapidly and now yeah. it's dying down. Maybe yeah. these things are shortened um, yeah. and they, they're going to be much more violent when they yeah. happen. But information is spread much more rapidly. Correct. Yeah. I think that's the case with just capital markets in general right. this day and age, yeah. right? Like the, the flow of information, the, the ability to move 42 or 52 billion yeah. or whatever it is in a day was just not possible 15 right. years ago. Um, and and, and act now, first and then yeah, think later. Act Vision. first, think later, right? You got your money at Silicon Valley Bank <laughs> right. and you know all of a sudden you hear Peter Thiel say something yeah. and you're like, I'm out yeah. immediately. And, and, the, and the transfer process is so seamless now. And, you know, we haven't even gotten yet, but there's a crypt, there's a, there's a cryptocurrency question in here for <laughs> you. So just for forewarning, that's another, no, like, a, but yeah. another way to, to transact yeah. these kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, and I just think whether it's capital, whether it's the stock market or, you know, yeah. bank runs like there, you know, there, we, we sort of, not joke because that's the wrong word. We we sort of had this, you know, moment where we saw the people lining outside of Silicon, uh, sorry, out of First Republic Bank here in Brentwood in California, yeah. and we're like, why are people at the actual bank? Like, <laughs> you, you could just go online and you know, move, move your money, money immediately. Yep. Yeah. Um. So with that being said, um, I would assume you 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 laid. You, you kind of laid the case of the coming out of this pandemic and things really are just, it's a really extraordinary times, right? The Fed, who basically ha is managing the economy and the monetary policy, now is in kind of in a pickle, if you want to call it, right? What's, uh, wh what do we think this is, this is going to mean for them going forward? I, I don't assume that, I, I can't even think of Powell's, how hard Powell's job is at this point. There's obviously some regulatory issues with the San Francisco Fed. Uh, what, what, what do we think is going to happen going forward from your perspective? Well, they've got to balance the risk of contagion against the risk of inflation. And yeah. that is what they're trying to do. And that is why the market feels good in a curious way um, <laughs> when the contagion looks like it might be spreading. Um, so the banking sector comes under pressure, the cyclical sectors come under pressure, uh, but the secular growth sectors yeah. balance it out. Um, and when the markets began to calm down in the financial sector, the yeah. cyclicals began to steady and some of the tech yeah. stocks come in, came under pressure. Um, so you see it playing out in the market. And right. I would say... The market currently is anticipating that we are close to um, the terminal rate for yeah. Fed policy. And the key question is, at what point might they start cutting? Yeah. And um, the, the Fed will be thinking that through. I think it was sensible of them to put a market down with 25 basis points just mm -hmm. to say, look, we're, we're not going to do a flip-flop here, but we need time to think. Um, that will play out over time, um, but the the markets be, can begin to sense the yeah. beginning of the end of this phase of Fed tightening. And when it comes, and precisely how it comes, is actually less important than sort of the generate, you know, the, the, you, you can sense the animal spirits coming back. Sure. Um, there's a lot of money parked on the sideline that has yeah. accumulated over the past, you know, year yeah. and a bit. Um, it's going to be super interesting to see where that money goes. Because remember, not only were equity assets around the world hit in 22, right. but so were bond assets. Yeah. Sure. And that's led to a pile of money on the sidelines. And I think it's yeah. another reason to feel cautiously optimistic about markets. I, I yeah. don't think at capital, we certainly don't try and time markets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we pay our investors on their investment returns up to eight years. So we're looking right. to take long-term views and that enables us not to have to think too much about where the market's going to be at the end of this year. And that gives right. us opportunity. But we're certainly cautiously optimistic about the route of markets over the next, say, 
you know, three years, we can see lots of opportunity around the world. Yeah. I love that answer because a lot of clients ask us now, like, why are the markets holding up despite all this, what seems is chaos, right? And I think your answer is spot on is, you know, the, the market is trying to figure out what's next here and you have to look, take a longer term view. So you can't really time these things. Speaking of that, you know, and this is future money. And the idea here is really to kind of figure out what the opportunity is. And I think I heard that before, never let a crisis go to waste. Where, where does capital see in opportunities in, in, in times like these? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we'd broadly categorize them in three areas. I think all of these areas kind of add up to a, a sense of there are more shots on goal in mm -hmm. terms of future opportunities. If we'd been having this conversation after the financial crisis, say yeah. in March of 2009, and we knew then what we know now, then I would have said, invest in US innovation yeah. and go out as far as you can because rates are coming down. Yeah. And so that would have led all your clients into NASDAQ, into software yeah. companies, et cetera. And the results would have been fantastic. It was quite a narrow market. Yeah. When we sit here now and try and anticipate the same question, it looks like there's going to be a much broader set of opportunities. And we would yeah. categorize those in three. Firstly, innovation still here. Yeah. Um, it could be artificial intelligence. It could be the um, potential in the cloud. Um, it could be medical science and yeah. the tremendous advances there. Think of obesity. Um, yeah. Think mm -hmm. of new, more targeted cancer treatments. Mm -hmm. But you've got to be more selective about what you pay yeah. because yeah. you need cash flows today to get to the cash flows tomorrow, the opportunity. And as we discussed in the previous part of this um, podcast, the, the venture capitalists, the early stage tech investors aren't finding access to capital as easy or as cheap as they did before. Right. So companies in the public markets, tech companies, innovative companies that have cash flows today, think of Microsoft with 85% yeah. of their earnings from subscription revenues. Yeah. That Those are really quite exciting areas. So that's area number one, a selective approach to growth investing. Mm -hmm. Second area is international investing. It's no longer just US growth. You can invest if, if you believe in the healthcare um, stories, the, the, the opportunities in medical science, lots of healthcare companies, both biotech, pharma, medtech, um, outside of the US. Um, tremendous opportunities in industrials, as the world thinks about rewiring the power grid, lots of those companies around the world. So international markets are beginning to look really interesting because there are broader opportunities. Yeah. And the third area is dividend paying companies. Now that depends on where you are right. um, as an investor, but a couple of um, data points I think are instructive. Um, in the last nearly a hundred years, dividends produce 36% of the total return of equities in the US. In the 2010 decade, that went down to 12% because growth was the only game in town. Sure. Now, I'm not saying we're like the 70s, but 1970s started with a narrow market, the Nifty 50 rolling yeah. over. Yeah. There was inflation beginning to build. There was geopolitical tension and real wars. So yeah. there are some things that rhyme with where we are today. Yeah. To dividends made up 74% of total Jeez. returns wow. in <laughs> the 70s. So dividends are worth looking at again as part of the total return package yeah. uh, when, or, when investors are thinking about where they should go. So selective approach to growth, dividends, international stocks, more shots on goal. Uh -huh. I mean, I love that answer yeah. because that's exactly where GK thinks of 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 where to put money right now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as a, as a side note, you know, we started the firm in 2010 post financial crises, 
and we benefit, benefited tremendously from in, investing in technology and growth and so forth. So I, I definitely see that that what happened then in hindsight and now going forward to the next 10 years, I think it's important to think differently and see where the world is going. So I'm, I'm glad that we, we think the same way. With that, we're talking innovation. So Bitcoin <laughs> is something that I know you wanted to touch on this, right? So, I, yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, and, and I know Capital Group doesn't really do this, so you know this is kind of just a philosophical discussion, let's call it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we we saw Bitcoin, depending on who you ask, is a hedge on inflation. It's a risk asset. It's a tech stock. It's a. <laughs> and actually, I saw a correlation with the Nasdaq 100 yesterday, and it's almost like it, it looks almost identical, sure. just the more aggressive. Um, but. Bitcoin was one of the only things that rallied when this banking crisis sort of came to the to the forefront, um, lending it to be sort of like this sort of hedge on banks, this sort of risk asset. Um, is Bitcoin really a viable alternative to a financial system that some people, depending on who you ask, view the financial system as sort of inherently flawed because of how it's constructed and and bitcoin is of all the cryptocurrencies i just want to talk about bitcoin specifically because there is you know it's finite it's a it's on the blockchain they're not printing more of them there it has some kind of utility do you guys see that or talk that about that at all as as sort of a, a, an alternative parallel financial instrument so you're absolutely right. We don't invest in um, Bitcoin, as I said, at the, the top of the yeah. discussion. We just do equities and bonds. Um, but we are interested in adjacencies and how they might impact our investments. So we do discuss mm -hmm. it. And in simplistic terms, we think that Bitcoin um, could be either a currency or an alternative source of or alternative store of value. And we looked at it through those two dimensions. And as a currency, we don't think it really works except in a few mm -hmm. exceptional situations. So if your fiat currency, as in your dollar or your euro, um, is um, falling apart, think some South yep. American countries, mm -hmm. then actually Bitcoin can be used as a currency. Yep. But these are exceptions rather than the rule. Yep. As an alternative source of assets, it does have some, um, as you quite rightly pointed out, you, need, you can draw some really interesting observations from correlation. And gold correlates with certain types of markets. Mm -hmm. And it would appear that Bitcoin correlates with other types of markets. Yep. Now, there's a very healthy health warning here. <laughs> and that is that Bitcoin's really only been around whilst we've had this really strong growth market right, then yeah. the end of the growth market. And then perhaps the um, inkling that the growth market might not be as dead as we thought it was because of the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. Right. So we haven't got enough data to know just how well it will correlate through multiple cycles. Gold has thousands of years. It has millennia of sure. data. Um, whereas Bitcoin is relatively new. But from what we have, it does look like it's correlated with secular growth assets. Yeah. Um, and so I think you know it's up to financial advisors like yourselves to think about where it should be, but alternative stores of value tend in most asset allocations to be really quite small yeah. Um, yeah. and used as a hedge as opposed to an asset. Yeah, that's exactly how we think of it, too. Yeah. So that's awesome. Thank you so much, David. This is really, really awesome insight. I want to geek out for a minute. And, and simply mm -hmm. because I know European, you worked for um, uh, UBS and, 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 um, and, and European banks. There is this thing that happened when Credit Suisse got bought out. And I hope, again, I hope it's not too technical, but some of the 81s or some of the bonds from Credit Suisse went to zero while the equity did not go to zero. This mm. is in any finance textbook, right? You look at your cap structure, bonds never go to zero before equities. So this is really something new. Everyone is talking about it. I'm sure there's going to be lawsuits, a lot of lawsuits. 
What happened there? What do you think? So 81s are contingent capital instruments, which is kind of a perpetual capital yep. um, layer um, that sits somewhere between bonds and equities, but it is determined by the legal specifics in the um, documentation. Um, the Swiss National Bank are pretty clear that the legal <laughs> documentation holds up. So there is a question of how many people actually read all that legal documentation. <laughs> um, so when you look through it, it is not surprising to us, at least, um, that the Swiss took this decision. Um, different 81s have different legal structures, depending on the jurisdiction. This was a specifically Swiss issue. Um, nevertheless, people um, are trying to figure out exactly where they should put uh, these 81s in the uh, capital structure. Yeah. Um, those statements, um, the fine print is now being read in some detail, I can assure you, by everybody <laughs> who holds it to try and figure out where they stand. Sure. Um, I think, you know, it will settle out. It's a pretty new instrument, if you remember. It was uh, created yep. um, really after the financial crisis, particularly during the European crisis, that itself was an echo of the financial crisis with yeah. the strains it put on of the euro and the European um, financial system that hadn't really dealt with the fundamental problems of 0809 in the way that the United States did. Um, so this is part of the discovery process, um, yeah. exactly where these individual 81s rank in each jurisdiction's interpretation of what a capital structure looks like. So it's, it's isolated. That's what I'm hearing. I should... Well, it might be. And that's what people <laughs> okay. are trying to understand. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, you know, thank you for bringing all these insights. Um, let's not talk about banks now. Let's talk. I know you're an ESG expert. Gerber Kawasaki has been also a leader in impact investing ESG from our beginning. And there's been a lot of dark clouds around the, the term ESG these days. I know Capital Group has been doing ESG and impact investing for many, many years before, before it was trendy. Can you talk to us a little bit about like the state of, of, of affairs here and, and, and maybe kind of clear up some of the terminology for us? Yeah, so um, firstly, we don't do impact investing, but we yeah. do incorporate ESG. And that's an important distinction when I come to the answer. Yeah. Um, where I think there is a difference between what is happening in, say, Europe and the United States around ESG is in Europe, there are a set of regulations that are looking to direct capital uh, or investments towards or away from industries and companies, depending on where they are in the ESG taxonomy. Right. And in the United States, there is a general aversion to having government direction of capital. Sure. And so I think it's less that ESG is the issue. That's certainly how it plays out. It's more about exclusionary elements of ESG are the issue. And when you look into the problems that various states have um, with ESG investing, it's because it's excluding some element of an industry that's important to that state. Right. So the way we've been thinking about um, ESG before all of this was really as an externality. Um, an externality in the economic textbook is something that you really can't put a number to that has a profound effect on the long-term value of the asset that you're looking to invest in. Governance is an obvious example. Governance is an intangible, but can have an <laughs> enormous effect as we just discussed around the banks. Sure. And so what we've been looking to do is try and essentially make our isolate, well, not isolated. We, we had best practices all over the firm in terms of analysts and portfolio managers who really understood governance, really understood some of the social impacts on companies. But we wanted to have a much more consistent approach to that best practice. And so we went around several years ago to all of our analysts and said, in order to be able to bring in these new ESG tools, this new ESG data, what do you need us to do? And they said, well, we need help because we're already doing a lot of work to analyze the long-term yeah. value of companies. 
So we created an ESG team that work with our analysts who make the final decision yeah. about whether to buy or sell a company, but they're able to talk them through some of these elements. So if you think about it, we're a long-term investor sure. and we're looking to understand companies' governance. We're looking to understand how they impact um, the world that uh, they uh, inhabit, how they treat their people. And all of these things that if we said to the marketplace, we think we should incorporate these into our investment toolbox to make us better long-term investors, people would say, of course you should. <laughs> but because they're labeled ESG, it yeah. creates a, a frisson. It becomes a little bit more um, mm -hmm. combative, yeah. controversial. Yeah, I mean, the details, right? Like, politics. Yeah, politics, nuance. Be. I think that's what yeah. we lose in as a society these days, is the nuance of things. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you again. First of all, thank you for the stewardship for our clients' assets, our funds. We have a lot of money with Capital Groups, and you have done a fantastic job for us, for our clients, for many, many years. Uh, thank you for your time and your insights. This was a very, very awesome conversation for me. It really to make sense of some of the chaos and maybe not the disaster that's going on. Yeah. So, so <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up with this. We started, Hatem started the conversation by saying the word disaster. And now, now. we're going to, we're going to, thanks to David, he has calmed Hatem down. Yeah. Now Hatem can go calm his, all of his clients down. Yeah. But I, you know, I think like you, David, like Capital Group, I, you know, one of the reasons we've we've always loved Capital Group is our sort of thinking is aligned with you guys, our firm, yep. our firm's values. Obviously, you guys are a much older company than us, but you know, our firms have all have always aligned on our viewpoints on investment, on ESG, on the thought processes, on multiple people working on you know uh, portfolios together, um, and so. Like uh, like you, we we've sort of been in this. You know, we think this is you know contained. We think this is not going to be as big of an issue. Cautiously optimistic is a phrase I've been using with yep. our clients a lot. Um, so we appreciate in knowing that you know a company that manages two and a half trillion uh, thinks the same way as us. And and you've done a great job explaining everything, answering all the questions, and doing so, you know, without getting too too technical. Um, which are, I'm sure our client, our uh, viewers will appreciate. Yeah, <laughs> no, we try to do that. <laughs> um, thank you again for for being on, David. Thank oh, you thank so you much. for having me. Thoroughly enjoyed that. Awesome, Great. awesome.